Merci, merci. Euh, je suis heureuse d'être ici à vous parler de l'avenir des organisations. D'accord. I want to start with uh, a story about Bree Pettis. Bree's a friend of mine in New York City. And Bree is a technologist. He's an inventor. He's the kind of person that likes to work with his hands. And so as part of a technology meetup in Brooklyn, New York, he and a group of other people were starting to build prototypes of new products about five years ago. And they ran into a problem. The problem was they needed new tools to prototype and create versions of their designs that would allow them to understand what they could be, how they should be changed and iterated. And as a result, they started looking for a 3D printer. And five years ago, a 3D printer was going to cost them about two to three hundred thousand dollars in US, which today is about two to three hundred thousand dollars euro as well. Um, he, he was trying to find one. They couldn't put the money together. And so for weeks and weeks, they were thinking about this. Where can we get access to what we need? How can we get access to what we need? And then they had a realization. Rather than trying to buy a 3D printer, what if they stopped making what they were making and tried to make a 3D printer? And that's exactly what they did. And over the next weeks and months, they created what ultimately became this 3D printer you see in the middle here. They called it the Cupcake One. They didn't have a marketing department at that time. And the Cupcake One was capable of printing objects in about 200 micron resolution, six inches by six inches, give or take. And they were able to do this for a cost of just $2,500. So you're talking about a 100x reduction in the cost of the technology from a few folks in Brooklyn who decided to put this thing together. And it was rough. I mean, you can see it. It's pieces from the local electronics store. It's Raspberry Pi computer boards. It's you know, CNC cut wood, but it worked. And other people around the world that were makers, that were prototypers, that were developers, found this and said, we want one too. And a business was born, a business that was called MakerBot. And they received funding, and they released iteration after iteration of the product itself. And here you see Brie on the cover of Wired magazine, four years later, holding the latest MakerBot, the Replicator 2. And they've since moved on to further replicators that are able to do 100 micron resolution, that are controlled by a mobile phone, that are connected to the cloud, that can 3D scan an object that you put in them and reprint that object without you knowing a single thing about CAD or 3D software or design. So incredible democratization of this technology, all in the hands of a few people that created this in just four or five years' time. Shortly after this article was published, Bree and his colleagues at MakerBot were purchased by Stratasys, the very company they couldn't afford to buy the printer from, for $406 million. And I like to joke with Bree and with Stratasys when I spend time with them that if they could have gone back in time five years, they could have given Bree and all his friends a job and a free 3D printer and saved $405 million. But that's the world we live in. And I think it's an incredible, incredible time to be alive, right? You think about what's possible today for the average person, the average entrepreneur, and it's an incredible difference from what we're used to seeing. There's really three things that are different. The first is that we have much better access. So as you see in this picture here, this is uh, Gordon Moore, one of the co-founders of Intel. And he has this Moore's law that most people have heard about, which is that the amount of power you can put on a computing chip, or really any exponential technology, will double every 18 months at the same price. And so every 18 months, everything we're using is getting twice as good, give or take, at the same price point. And the effect is that essentially every single one of you has in your pocket a computer that is stronger than what took us to the moon. And what do you do with it? You look at pictures of cats, <laughs> right? Because it's surplus power. It's so much computing power, so much information, so much access that we don't even know what to do with it. And as a result, there are now more mobile phones in the world than there are people. There are now more people learning to code than ever before. There's more information created every year than in the prior years, right? So we have this sort of massive explosion of what people are able to get access to, what they're able to use, such that a gentleman in Brooklyn can reinvent a 3D printer in his spare time. That's the world we live in. The second issue is that there are better platforms. 
And what I mean by platforms are things that other people, other businesses can use to build their business, right? So if you think about it, you build a product and it's very interesting, it's very successful, maybe you build something internally for your own use, but then suddenly it has value to someone else. And in the old world, in a world that didn't change very fast, the platforms that we built could only be used linearly. When you build this Carousel de Louvre, there can only be one conference in this room at any given time. You can't have two conferences in here, it would be chaos, right? But when you build something like Amazon Web Services, a cloud data storage tool, that can be used by millions of people at the same time. And so all the work that's being created by these startups, by these entrepreneurs, now becomes platform for the next entrepreneur, for the next startup to use. And that's a really powerful idea because it creates this ladder, this ability to stand on the shoulders of everyone around us. And the third issue is that we have better networks than ever before. So again, thinking about how things used to be, we didn't used to be connected. Then it was the railroad, then it was the airplane, suddenly the internet comes along, then mobile phones. Now the Internet of Things comes along, and we start to think about not just people being connected on Facebook and LinkedIn, et cetera, but actually things being connected. That my air conditioner talks to my light, which talks to my door lock, which talks to the energy company, and tells each other things to do to optimize my experience, right? All those networks are there. And as a result, you get this phenomenon where if you have a great idea, you can build it and test it easier than ever before. And if it actually is a great idea, it will spread across the network faster than ever before. I like to talk to audiences to say, if we just all said, you know what, let's not do the conference today, let's invent the next great app, there is no reason, no friction in the world preventing us from having an app with 100 million users tonight. The only thing stopping that from happening is that the app we would develop probably wouldn't be that good. But if it was that good, it would spread, and it would spread, it could spread, almost at an unlimited pace. And that's just a very different reality that now businesses can grow and scale in new ways. So I want to talk about Uber for a second. It's a touchy subject. I actually don't want to talk about Uber as like, oh, Uber's so amazing, and I don't want to talk about Uber as, oh, Uber's so terrible. All I want to talk about is this. What did Uber invent? Think about that for a second. They didn't invent GPS, they didn't invent cars, they didn't invent livery services, they didn't invent the App Store or apps or iOS, they didn't invent the language that they wrote the code in, right? All they invented was this very thin layer between people who need a ride and people who have a car and put the two together and take out some of the friction. Very thin layer, probably 1% of the total value that you get when you ride in an Uber was actually created by them. Everything else was already there. All the platforms, all the networks were right there waiting. And just by capitalizing on that last 1%, a $40 billion business is born. And even if that's too much, maybe we're in a bubble, let's call it 20 billion, or 10, or five. It doesn't matter, it's still a crazy successful outcome for a five-year-old company by just creating that thin layer. So that's the power of the access, the platforms, the networks that we have. Here's the impact, right? So now we look and we say, okay, how many years does it take for a company to reach a billion dollars in valuation or capitalization? Well, the average Fortune 500, the answer is somewhere around 20. And then you have Google, and now it's eight, and then it's Facebook, and now it's six and Tesla, and Uber, and Snapchat, and Oculus Rift. Does any, I'm not a mathematician, but does anyone see the pattern? It's heading towards some very scary low number, some sub-year number that says you can build a billion dollars in value in a very short amount of time. And that creates interesting pressures on the world around us. So here's the thing. At the same time as it's the most incredible time to be alive because you can do anything, it's also the most complex and complicated and uncertain time to be alive. If you think about what's going on here, there's more competition, there's more information, there's more volatility than ever before because it's so easy to compete. 
it's so easy to get information. It's so easy to be thrown by something that changes. The price of oil changes, and suddenly thousands of companies are trying to react because there's volatility in the system. Or we have a day on the stock exchange where the algorithms freak out and nobody knows why, and we, you know, the stocks dip and they jump back up again, and we literally can't even explain what happened. We live in a world where there's so much interconnectedness and so much information power that it's hard to predict what will happen next. And in fact, you could argue that it's impossible to predict what will happen next. And that creates pressure. What astounds me and what I work on every day is the fact that amidst all that change, all that tumult, all that innovation, one thing has stayed the same. One thing has stayed remarkably unremarkable and that's our organizations. The organizations that most of us work in, the biggest companies in the world, more or less run exactly the same way as they did five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. In some cases, they run the same way they did 100 years ago, right? Because we haven't changed the very nature of what we do. And it's a crime because we spend more than half our lives there. We spend more than half our lives at work and yet the way we work, the way we organize, the way we come together is essentially the same as it has been since before the invention of the computer. And that's changed everything. So how can the organizations not change as well? They haven't, and it started to do us a disservice. The first data point is that, by and large, most people are not happy at work. So this is about 17.5% of the workforce, this is US data, although I've actually looked at the French data and it's not, not too dissimilar, actively disengaged, meaning I'm so unhappy at work that I am actively fighting against what we're doing. I'm, I'm looking for another job or I'm trying to sabotage something or I'm actively not caring. And then you have 51% of people who are just disengaged. They're just showing up, they go to the meeting, they don't care, it's just, uh, they just work to live. They want to get home to the kids, get home to the game, right? So there you have 68% of everybody at work not rowing the boat. And then what's left in the green are the people that are engaged, right? That are actually plugged in, that are excited about where they work, that are excited about what they're doing, that really show up. And that's a huge issue because it's not as if we have everything figured out. We have global issues, political issues, issues of you know, inequality, issues of environmental sustainability, issues of innovation that need our best work, and yet we can't even show up to get it done. There's another impact of all the trends we just talked about, and that is that it is much, much harder to stay big for very long. So in 1958, if you were on the S&P 500, which is one of the biggest indexes of large, important companies in the world, you would be on there about 60 years, which is an incredible long run. 60 years of being one of the biggest and the best. That is just like, get out the cigar, sit back in your leather chair, and enjoy that success. You don't have to work for that. Now look at this. Globalization happens. Connectivity happens. Computers happen. The world changes. And suddenly, we're sitting in a place where today, the average is more like 15 years that you're going to be on that list before you fall off. And even that is skewed because there are companies on there like GE that have been on the list for 122 years. So the actual reality, the actual point of fact, is that every five years, half of those 500 companies will change going forward. 50%. Look to your left, look to your right. One of you will not be here in five years. That's what we're talking about. It's crazy. So it's really hard to stay big amidst all this change and pressure. And when I tell that to CEOs, they say, yes, yes, I, we feel that. We know we need to change. We know we need to get out in front of this. But here's the problem, Aaron. We can't change fast enough. Why not? Well, because this is our org chart. This is the org chart for the ushealthcare.gov, the public health system. Is it any wonder it didn't work on the first day? It's unbelievable. And this is not a technical diagram. These are the groups of people that have to work together to deliver health care to the American people. And what's crazy is, although this looks complex and complicated, 
when I actually get in and start to unpack the org charts and the connections and the P&Ls and the business units of the biggest companies in the world, they all look like this. You can draw it prettier, but it's, it's chaos, right? There's so many different sides of the coin. You've got the P&Ls, and you've got the regions, and you've got the functions, and everybody's trying to get efficiency out of this thing. And it's a Rubik's Cube, and it can't be solved, right? So it's a huge problem because we don't know how to move forward. We know we need to go faster. We know that even if we have the new hot startup, we know it's going to get big and then it's going to get bad. But we don't know what to do about it. We don't have that new way of operating, that new way of working that we need to solve for this. And so we ask ourselves, where can we turn for inspiration? Well, the first thing we did was look at the you know, new kind of hot companies. You know, go spend time with the Ubers and the Googles and the Teslas of the world and see what they're doing. And the fact is they're doing some interesting stuff. Some of their ways of working and operating are unique and new and different. But nobody has a theory of the whole thing, a theory of a whole new way of working that's not just in pieces. And so we started looking in less conventional places. We started looking for an unexpected source of inspiration, right? And here's what we found. There are all these systems out there called complex adaptive systems. And I brought three of them with you here today. I didn't bring them in person. They're just pictures. Um, ants, your immune system, the neurons in your brain, the city that you live in, all of these are part of a class of systems that is self-organizing and self-managing and yet manages to, in the face of a lot of uncertainty, a lot of volatility, a lot of change, a lot of pressure, they manage to continue to adapt, to continue to innovate. They are big, but they are not slow. They're able to move and change and breathe and be a living organism in the face of all that. So we started to talk to the experts about this stuff and say, what is this? How does all this work? And there's a woman by the name of Melanie Mitchell who used to work at the Santa Fe Institute for Complexity, and I spent some time with her. And she basically said, here's what you're looking at. All these systems, and there are over 80 of them, are systems in which large networks of components, so think lots of people in our case, with no central control, so think no CEO, fewer managers, no middle management, and simple rules of operation, right? Simple rules of operation meaning values, clarity about purpose, clarity about where we're going, right? They give rise to this collective behavior, this sophisticated information processing, and this adaptation via learning or evolution. And what that means is simply they think. They think in the aggregate. They are a brain. They are a learning machine in the aggregate. Do we all get smarter together, or do we get dumber together, or do we stay the same together? The individual is no longer as important as the whole, as the collective, as the team. And these systems do that. So if you take, uh, let's say, a cell of a slime mold, which if you're a complex adaptive systems theorist is a really interesting organism and otherwise is pretty boring, and you put you know, 50 slime mold cells on the side of a tree, nothing happens. But if you put 500 on the side of the tree, they gather together into one organism and they start marching across the forest floor because they need each other in order to do that cognition, in order to operate. So I want to just touch on three of these to sort of bring this to life. The first is ants. So ants get a bad rap. People think ants are troublesome, they're, you know, they're, they're bothersome, but they're actually one of the most successful species on the planet, right? There are more ants on the planet by mass than pretty much anything else. They're incredibly successful. And when you think about ants, you think, oh, there's the queen, and she's given the orders, right? But the queen doesn't give any orders. The queen just gives birth to the new workers, the next generation. The queen is the HR manager, right? That's it. She's just hiring. She's hiring, she's hiring. But all the other ants are essentially the same. They're essentially similar. And they all have to decide who's going to do what work in real time. And only their information decides. If you take all the patrollers that go out of an, of an ant colony to go looking around for where it's safe to look for food, and you get rid of them, you steal them, the other ants that used to be foragers or that used to work in the nest, they step up and become patrollers. And if you get rid of the people that work in the nest or the midden workers, then they get replaced. And if it's a hot day, then the colony will choose not to go out during peak hours. They'll wait until it's 
the sun sets, right? All this decision making, all this change, all this response, but without anyone in charge. So it, it really begs the question, how are they doing that? How does the information flowing through them and the simple rules that they have encoded in them allow them to create all that emergence? The second example is your immune system. So everyone in this room, by and large, has an incredible complex adaptive system right inside your body. If you think about it, you have a handful of competitors in your business. You have one or two or three competitors. You can sort of say, these are the guys that we really have to beat. You know, these are the ones that are in our crosshairs. But the immune system has infinite competitors. It has to compete against everybody at the same time. All sorts of pathogens and assailants that are attacking your body, allergens, bacteria, it's all coming for you, right? And they have to figure out how to react. So how do they react amidst all that uncertainty? Well, the way it reacts is it generates essentially 10 million lymphocytes. And if there are any immunologists in the room, yes, I am dumbing this down. They, they generate tens of millions of, of lymphocytes. They all go out into the body, and they all look for their match in a pathogen, in something dangerous. And a few of them find it, and when they find it, they release a signal. We've got product market fit. We have a successful startup here. And the signals go out, and when enough signals go out, those startups are drawn up into your lymph nodes. This is why they swell. And the lymph nodes invest in those startups. The lymph nodes I like to think of as the venture capital community of the body. They invest in those startups, and those lymphocytes get replicated and scale. They go back out in the body, they bind with all that matching pathogen, and they destroy it. And this works beautifully every single day. And what's interesting is even when they find a winner, even when they find a fit, they don't abandon the random approach. They don't abandon the innovation. Every day, you're still going to get those 10 million unique new startups in the body, as well as the ones that get doubled down on. So there's kind of a rule there about how we innovate in the face of uncertainty. And then finally, the city, right? So we all live in these remarkable cities, whether it's Paris or New York City or Stockholm. They're all incredible living things. And what we found is that there was some research done recently that showed that every time you double the size of a city, the productivity and the innovation on a per person basis goes up by 15%. 15% more productive, more innovative in a twice as big city. Which makes sense, right? Because think about it. More interactions, more exposure to different ideas, more sidewalks, more chances to get lost, more chances to find new inspiration. It actually works that way. Now, what about the opposite? What about our organizations? Anybody want to take a vote on if I double the size of a company, a 10,000 person company, and make it a 20,000 person company? Is it going to get more or less innovative and productive? Right? Less, less, way less. We all know this. We've experienced it. It doesn't have to be that way, but that's the way it is. And why is that? Well, the reason is that these three systems all share essentially the exact same operating model, the same values in the way they embrace the world. And the organization doesn't. It has a completely different operating system. And so what we've done is we've actually taken a look at what are the old traditional values, the things we think we're supposed to care about in business, the 20th century ideas for a world that doesn't change very fast, and what is the new 21st century idea that's rooted in these complex systems, that's rooted in adaptation? And what does that transition look like? And maybe where can we get a, a sense of who's doing it well? And so I'd like to start with this first shift from profit to purpose. If you focus on profit, if that's all you do is try to squeeze the, the juice out of the lemon or the orange, you don't get as far as if you focus on the purpose today. And the reason is that we all have a choice of where we go to work. So if you're an ant and you're born into an ant colony, you don't get to choose. You just have to go to work. There's no option. But if you're one of today's most talented workers, if you're an A-plus developer, if you're an A-plus designer, you get to choose where you go to work. And once you reach that level of success where you know you're going to get paid an incredible wage, and you know you're going to get an incredible bonus, and you're probably going to get equity, how do you choose where to go to work? Well, you don't choose based on who's the most profitable company. You choose based on where will I do the most meaningful work? Where will I do work that will challenge me? Where will I work with other people that are stunning colleagues? 
That is the decision-making process that's happening. And as a result, the people that have a clear purpose, that have a world-changing purpose, a dent in the universe, as Steve Jobs would say, right? They attract the best talent. And with the best talent, they can operate with more autonomy and more self-organization. And with that in place, they're able to evolve and adapt and do things that others can't do. They're able to take those moonshots that others can't take. And so this navigation has to occur. Now, it's not to say that profit's bad. Profit's great. But it just can't be the thing we organize around. We can't consistently focus on the quarterly profit at the expense of understanding our purpose. And a good example of this is Amazon. So Amazon, from the very beginning, from the very first shareholder letter, Bezos has been extremely clear with the investors. Here's what we're doing. We're doing a multi-decade, world-changing ambition here. We're going to be the everything store, or at least maybe one of two everything stores if you count Alibaba. We're going to be the everything store. And that's going to take a long time, and it's going to take a total investment of all of our proceeds in order to achieve it. It's a zero-sum game. And if you're up for that, invest. And if you're not up for that, don't invest. Don't expect me to give you quarterly guidance on profit and a dividend when we're in the middle of the fight of our lives here. right? And as a result, year over year over year, that investor base, that analyst base, has been taught to expect that behavior and that purpose focus from Amazon. And as a result, if you start measuring the shareholder return of CEOs, Jeff Bezos has the second highest shareholder return of any CEO in history. And the number one, of course, is Steve Jobs. And Herb Kelleher from Southwest Airlines is in there as well. Right? We're talking about 11,000% return to investors, even without profit, right? Because the profit will come. The profit is there. If you really study the balance sheet and the P&L, it's there. But it's being reinvested in this win. The second shift is from silos to networks. So in the past, when things didn't change very fast, you would silo to protect yourself. You would silo the people. You'd have clear functions, clear departments. Everybody had doors on their offices. I don't know if you guys remember that. Doors on the office to close people out, have that privacy. And that was the right way to operate in order to sort of promote this idea of status and to promote this protection of our IP and our secrets and what's going on. But in today's world, it, things are changing so fast, the new competitive advantage is who you're connected to. If you're not part of a network, if you don't have strength and knittedness in your business, then you're at a disadvantage. And that disadvantage becomes evident over time. So the example here is someone like Airbnb. So Airbnb now is the largest hotelier in the world by almost any measure. They're going to do 50,000 room nights tonight just in one US city. And here's the weird thing. Biggest hotelier in the world, you know how much property they own? None. They don't own any property. No CapEx, right? They don't own any property. They don't even own their office. They don't need to because they're part of this network. When you go to a hotel, it's so clear with a traditional hotel that you're inside or outside. You work there or you don't work there. You're a guest or you're not. But with Airbnb, you start to think, well, wait a second. I offer my home up for rent on the website so that someone else can stay there on vacation. They stay in my home. Now I'm part of the provider. I'm part of the solution. But then I go stay at an Airbnb in Paris, and now I'm a customer. And then there's a, a note from the owner on the refrigerator that says there's a great cafe downstairs. And I go to the cafe, and I have a cup of coffee. And now that store, that cafe, is part of the network. And where does it end, right? And it, that's the issue, is that when you try to break something like this down, too many people have a vested interest in it succeeding to tear it down. It's a whole new kind of strength that comes from the network. The third difference that we notice, and this is one of the most challenging for executives, is that there's this shift from planning to emergence. When things don't change very fast, a plan is super valuable. Right? You've taken the time to put the ducks in a row, to check everything. You know what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. You've aligned your resources to the plan. The problem is that when things change really fast, every, every day that you go execute that plan, it starts to deteriorate and become less and less valuable. And I often joke that a plan is nothing more than lies committed to paper. Right? It's just lies. You can pretend it's not, but every time I get that pushback, from CEOs, I say, OK, pull out last year's plan and walk me through it. And you let me know how it went. And by the second quarter, 
they're off the rails. It's, you know, we had, there was an M&A issue, or there was regulation, or something changed, or we had to launch a new product, and now the plan had to change. And then everybody has to scurry to fix the plan, right? Instead, what we need to do is start designing for emergence. It doesn't mean don't know what you want. It doesn't mean don't have goals. It doesn't mean don't go through the exercise of understanding future scenarios, or even doing a little bit of planning. It just means don't believe that that is gospel. It's only valuable insofar as it sets you up to be able to make choices in real time and react and respond to what happens. And so you want to be able to sort of plan, but only insofar as it allows you to have the future emerge from the organization as things unfold. More information, more data, more validation. Often people will bring me a year-long plan for the new product line they want to create. And I say, you know what, that's great but just go get one week of data. I'd rather have one week of data about this idea than a one-year plan. Because whatever you can go test in a week is worth more in terms of building our intuition, our understanding of the future, than what you can write down in months and months of planning. And the example here is a company called Valve that I bring to you from Seattle. So in Seattle, Valve is about a $4 billion company. They create games and software and hardware infrastructure for the gaming industry, they're one of the biggest players. They have some of the biggest titles. And there are two bullet points in the job description for Valve when you start there. Bullet point number one is find other great people like you. Right? You, you're amazing. You've come here to join us. Your number one job is to go find more people like you to join the Valve team. And the second bullet point on your job description is your desk has wheels on it. Go find something to do. That's it. No VP of finance, no head of IT, no uptime professionals, no designer of this game but not that game. Your desk has wheels on it. Go find something to do. We trust you to put yourself in the position to do the best work of your life. And as a result, what happens is this futures market inside Valve where instead of having an annual plan for what they should work on, you just look at the floor. Where are people rolling their desks to? Well, that guy had a game idea, and 50 people rolled their desk over there. That must be a pretty good idea. There's a lot of social validation going on there with that idea. This guy had an idea, and he's all alone. It's OK. Maybe, he has a, maybe it's a great idea. The guy that created Amazon Web Services was alone for a couple years. That's OK, too. But there's less data there. He's going to get less resources. He's going to have to tow it alone. It creates this flexibility and this emergence in the system of what they'll do, and there's a lot of value there. So one of the things you can do, without going that far, is just go back to the office and give everybody a fictional $100 to invest in all your initiatives, and see where people would put their money if they had the choice. Gives you a sense of what the emergent agenda is versus the agenda that you have politically. The fourth of six shifts is this shift from efficiency to adaptivity. So again, when things don't change fast, you want to design for efficiency so you can squeeze all the profitability, all the juice, out of the machine. You want to squeeze it. And so as a result, you build purpose-built materials. You build factories that can only make one type of cereal that have to push things out the door every 15 seconds, right? You design the box to be the perfect box. Everything has been designed to be specific. It's a deliberate choice, and it is a fixed choice. And I know this to be true because when I first started working with PepsiCo, I said, hey, what if we did something different with the cap? What if we wrote something on the cap or changed the color of the cap when you open a Pepsi? And I was laughed out of the room because apparently that was going to take like two years and cost $50 million to change the cap. Because they've built it for so much efficiency. When you're making you know, billions of Pepsis a day, you have to design for this so much efficiency that you can't change. And as a result, vitamin water and Red Bull and Five Hour Energy and all these other drinks that have come to dominate the market in the last 10 years have not come from the big players. They've come from small players that have that flexibility. Now, adaptivity is about saying it's not that efficiency is bad. Again, nothing on the left is bad. But are there places where we should be designing for adaptivity? And recently, there was an interesting story with some automakers in the US that really shined a light on this. So GM, General Motors, one of the biggest automotive companies in the world, had to do a bunch of recalls. 
And Toyota has had to do some recalls. There's been a lot of recalling in the last two years because things aren't working right. People are getting hurt, and these things were designed for efficiency, so they're not easy to change. You've got to bring it in, take things apart, put things back together again. It's very expensive. Tesla had a problem a couple years ago where it was hitting objects, it was hitting debris on the road and causing sparks and fire. And so they said, well, you know, this is an issue, and, and people were getting excited about it, and safety board came and said, we've got to do something about this. And you know what Tesla did? They opened a laptop, they hit a couple keys, and every Tesla in the world rose two inches. Recall done. And it's not as if Tesla did everything right, right? If it had been a tire issue, if it had been a windshield issue, they wouldn't have been able to do that. But they were lucky in that they built adaptivity into the vehicle in the place they needed it most. The fact that the vehicle is connected to the web, connected to the internet, that it has control of its height, gave them the ability to avoid a recall. And so all we ask is that as you're considering the features and functionality of the product, as you're considering the way you're developing the room that you're in even, how you set furniture around, consider the value of adaptivity versus the value of that efficiency, the value of being able to change in a future that's uncertain. The next one, and I think one of the most human shifts that we're noticing, is that we've moved from now a world of control, where you're a factory worker for me, and I want to control what you do, and you punch in and you punch out, and the only way to get what we want out of people is to control them, is to bind them in these rules and these processes. We have to standardize and ensure that everything is efficient, right? That whole mindset breaks down in this world of fast-paced change. And not only does it break down, but it demotivates. Remember when we talked about engagement? People are disengaged because the system sucks. They don't like it. It doesn't make them feel human. It doesn't make them feel like they can bring their whole self to work. And as a result, you think about moving to an empowerment model. And my favorite example here is to think about sports, right? You think about a game of football or a game of American football or a game of basketball. You have a play that you're trying to run. Everybody knows what they're trying to do. They're trying to get the ball to the other end of the field or the court. But once the play begins, if things change, people are not looking to the coach to tell them what to do. They'd be plowed over. They have to decide on their own by communicating, constant interactions between the team members. They have to use their own individual autonomy to do what's best for the team in the moment. That's how we run a sports team. That's how we should run a business. They need to be able to act in the moment with autonomy in order to achieve what needs to be achieved. Otherwise, it'll take too long. I have sat with countless teams where a decision needs to be made in order to move a project forward or move a deal forward, and it goes up through 15 different people. And they all look at it like, well, I, yeah, I approve this, but Sally and HR has to approve this, and Bill and finance has to approve this. Everyone's approving everything, but no one's accountable for the decision. It's broken. It's totally backwards. So we move to this empowered future. And an example of this is a company called Zappos, right? Zappos is a, a footwear brand. They're moving to a system that's called Holacracy. H-O-L-A-C-R-A-C-Y, Holacracy. And Holacracy is a way of distributing authority. It's a way of getting in a room and saying, who should do what? How do we give away more power? How do we make sure that we know where power sits? That we know who has the rights to make certain choices? That we all have clarity about what we're doing, and that not only do we have clarity, but we have the ability to change it anytime we want. We can change our process. We can change our roles. We can change our accountabilities. We can hold multiple roles. They're putting all that into practice, and it's challenging at a scale of 2,000 people. They've lost people that couldn't make the shift. They've had to hire new people to help coach and facilitate, but they're moving in that direction of self-organization, and I'm very, very bullish on what we'll see there. There's another organization here in Europe called Bertsorg. It's a nursing organization that is also highly self-organized, highly empowered, letting each unit in each region, each market, decide how they'll go to market, how they'll deliver care. And they've had remarkable results as well over decades, just completely dominating the competition. The final shift I want to talk about is from privacy to transparency. We used to live in this world where it was better to keep it secret, right? What are you working on? It's secret. What, what is Bill in, in, in you know, the executive room doing? No, he, the door's closed. You can't know, right? They're having, a, they're having an executive meeting. We'll find out in six months what that was about. Don't worry about it, right? Everything was about privacy. And in the future, 
We don't know what's important information. We don't know what insights might be drawn out of different pieces of information in the organization, outside or in. And so when we embrace transparency and say, you know what, it's better actually if everybody has access. It's better if everybody has a chance to see if they can draw some value out of the information. If we trust each other with the transparency and we expect each other to behave like adults with that information, then incredible things happen. An example of this is from a company called Patagonia. So Patagonia makes outdoor equipment, right? They make outdoor apparel. And their whole um, ambition is essentially to create things that are sustainable for the earth, that have the lowest possible impact. And they do campaigns where they say things like, don't buy a new jacket this year from us or anyone. Re you know, re reuse your jacket, right? They're very committed to this mission. And what they did in the last four years is they made public their entire supply chain, their entire manufacturing process, and showed with deep, rich videos and explanations everything that was going on, the good, the bad, the ugly. And what they thought was, you know, maybe this is going to get us in trouble. Maybe people will criticize us. They'll say that we don't live up to our values. They'll, they'll find ways to attack us. What happened instead is that their competition, people that work for them, people that don't work for them, people in government, all came forward and offered them improvements on what they saw. Here's a new material that you can use that has a lower you know, off-gassing. Here's a new process that you can use. Here's a new facility in Shenzhen that you don't know about that can help you with this issue. They found thousands of ways to improve by being transparent. And a lot of organizations would say, no, 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 we don't want to expose our dirty laundry. We don't want to be you know, held accountable. But the benefit of the transparency far outweighed the cost. And so what I want to leave you with are these questions, these six dimensions that we have to understand. Purpose, networks, emergence, adaptivity, empowering, and transparency. These must be the values that we use in order to behave more like complex adaptive systems, to behave more like the human systems that we want to work at, that we want to engage at, to unlock our potential. Are we in pursuit of something meaningful? Are we leveraging growing and serving networks of people and technology? Are we actively building networks? Are we actively using them? Are we planning too much and not testing and learning enough? Are we doing the planning exercise for months every year? Are we out there learning in real time? Are we over-engineering things, right? Are we just designing for efficiency without ever thinking about the change that may need to come? Are we pushing authority to the edge of the organization so that the people in the work have the authority? Am I making IT decisions and I don't even know what a cloud is? Stop that. Don't do that. Let the people that know about the cloud make the cloud decision, right? Push it to the edge. And finally, are we letting information flow? Are we tightly knit? Are we able to reach any person in the organization? Are we working in public with multi-tenant documents using, whether it's a Google Apps or a Microsoft 365 or a Facebook group, ways to be working together in full view of everyone else? No finished products anymore. Don't finish and then share. Share and then finish, right? Transparency even over privacy. We bring these things together and we have a remarkable capability to not just confront the challenges ahead, but to achieve our potential as people, both alone and together in our organizations, and become truly responsive. Thank you.